You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I want to welcome back to the Final Say Radio Show. We have Charles Hoskinson. He's the opinion editor with the Washington Examiner. Charles, thank you so much for joining us again today. And I, I wish it were on better news and on better terms. Unfortunately, and I, I believe I'm correct on this, but I think this is the highest ranking U.S. military personnel who has been killed in combat since, I believe, the Vietnam War. We lost a general today, a, a two-star general in Afghanistan with a, an unbelievably brazen attack. Uh, it looks like... Uh, one of the Afghan soldiers turned his weapon on numerous soldiers, both American and non-American. It's, it's tragic, and uh, I'm glad that you can join us to help break this story down for us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I, I do want to, to point out that although this, uh, this, if this turns out to be true, it would be the highest-ranking U.S. officer killed in combat since the Vietnam War overseas, um, Lieutenant General Tim Maud, uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel for the U.S. Army, was killed in the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001. So he actually is, if you're talking about the highest-ranking death in the war on terrorism, he would be it. Oh, yeah, that's a very good point, and thank you for, for reminding us of that. Uh, Charles, if you can, uh, you know, the, this is an ongoing story. We've seen the green-on-blue attacks, but this seems very significant. And I, I suppose the fact that we're pulling out of Afghanistan, you know, in, in the coming time period, what does this mean for that pullout? Well, it's it, during the Vietnam War, there was a U.S. Senator, Republican George Aiken from Vermont, who said basically, you know, why don't we just declare victory and get out? Well, what Obama's done with Afghanistan is, in a sense, the opposite of that. He's declared, already declared defeat, but we're staying in. You know, we, we're. It's been. Uh, it was in May when Obama said that he was going to end the combat operations in Afghanistan at the end of this year and retreat to an advisory and training role, and with some limited counterterrorism um, operations as well. And you know, we as our forces draw down, as American forces draw down in Afghanistan, they lose the ability to protect themselves. So the, these green on blue attacks, they've been a problem for, for several years, and, and it, it's looking like they're not going to stop, although they did decline this year. Um, they have been declining for the past few months. Our ability to protect our soldiers is also going to decline as U.S. forces leave Afghanistan. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. And now it, it, it's hard to, to judge the gains that the Taliban are making right now, but it seems like they've they've been almost building up for a large offensive to take back a lot of the territory which we had gained throughout this you know longer than a decade endeavor here. And it and it's a shame uh, that. We're not in a situation now where Afghan forces can fully be replacing the, the United States forces in these areas to help maintain that. So that's one issue. The other issue, and I think we, we've both alluded to it, is the fact that when you project your moves ahead of time and declare, hey, we're pulling out anyway, I think you send a horrible message to not just the country that you're trying to help, but to its enemies that are always waiting for the opportunity to to take advantage of the of the openings that are left for them and, and in this case it's a significant opening i think and and i think this is a big deal what happened today i really do it is the, the taliban and the haqqani network another a group that's been operating in afghanistan have always looked for opportunities to score high profile successes and they've certainly gotten themselves a high-profile success today. Um, they also are certainly very interested in retaking the country when we've left. The, the question is, the, the, the question that's always been on the table is, will they be able to do it? The part of the problem, part of that question is, will the Afghan forces be loyal to the central government, or will they make their own deal? 
are they loyal to other other interests? Will they disintegrate as the Iraqi army did in the face of a terrorist assault? It's hard to say. You know, Charles, there's a handful of things that trouble me with the, this. Clearly, the whole concept of blue and green is absolutely awful, right? It's it's the ultimate in betrayal. But do you get a sense that this is historically uh, an ex- an expected norm? In other words, these things just happen; they're sad, and you and you there's no way around it. Or do you believe there's more that could have been done to prevent this? Uh, on the one hand, and or certain things such as the tribalistic tendencies or something about the local culture makes it, uh, let's say, a higher propensity that such blue and green attacks would occur in these areas. I think one of the big problems is that the United States is is hanging on there in Afghanistan after the president. I mean, the president has essentially already cut and run. But our soldiers have been dying there, fighting there. They're still doing that. Um, you know, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but three quarters of all the casualty, U.S. casualties, all the U.S. deaths in Afghanistan have been since Obama took office. That is a We've been there number. for 13 years, and three quarters of all of the U.S. deaths have occurred since Obama took office. This was the real war. If you recall the 2008 campaign, this was the real war. This was the war we had to win. And it's looking increasingly likely that we will not win it. Now, I would you made the comparison to what had happened in Iraq, where literally, I have no idea how much we spent. I tried to look it up, but didn't get uh, clean numbers. But somewhere, let's just say we probably spent hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, much of which went to training and building and supporting these troops who seem to just throw throw everything down and run in the face of ISIS. Do, do you have any sense that we should expect anything different in Afghanistan? Because it's hard to imagine the Taliban is any less vicious based on their history than ISIS is. They seem to be cut from the same vile cloth. Well, the question is loyalty. I mean, the Iraqi army was divided along sectarian lines, and the government was seen as sectarian. And as soon as those sectarian fault lines, there was some pressure on those sectarian fault lines, the army disintegrated. It was unable to to meet the threat. There are a lot of Sunni, Ara- Sunni Arab Iraqis who have cast their lot with the terrorists of ISIS because they don't... F- they don't trust the Shia government or they been feel oppressed by the Shia government. And, and there are a lot of fault lines in Afghanistan as well. The, the question that the government is seen as corrupt. Um, there's been, there was a very contentious presidential election that, that isn't, hasn't quite been resolved yet. There are ethnic tensions. There are religious tensions. Uh, the question with the Afghan forces after the United States leaves is who, where, the, where are their loyalties going to lie? When the when the Taliban start pressing, you know which way will they will they resist? Will they accommodate? Will they run? We don't know. Yeah, we've covered in the past the challenge of really poor rules of engagement that clearly have killed the U.S. forces and many of our allies because we well we tied at least one of their hands behind their back, which I don't believe we can ever do in the case of war. Do you have any sense that this was another problem? For example, you have to question how many and why, after so many of these attacks, have we had? Uh, do we still have these guys with with the arms that they can do this to us? And is there anything that you can offer uh, to the British responsibility or uh, or lack thereof? In other words, British, I understand, we're running this program. Uh, is this something that they are? Uh, let's say, experts at, that it was a wise move to have them do this, or is it a mistake to not take the protection of our own men, especially a major general, into our own hands 100%? Well, the United States is going to get to the point, if this hasn't already arrived, where it cannot protect its soldiers in Afghanistan. The, the, The infrastructure will no longer be there to protect U.S. soldiers. And that's the point where you have to ask, you know, is anything you gain from having them stay there worth the cost? 
and uh, we we may already be at that point. And, and this is this again. This goes back to the administration's policy. You, if you're going to win the war, if you want to win this war, you have to do certain things. And if you don't do those things, you're just you're just putting your forces on the path to losing. It may take longer if you stay longer, but it they're they're eventually going to lose. And you know, it, I fear right now that we're on the the situation that U.S. troops are in in Afghanistan is a situation where they simply slowly bleed to death as they are slowly pulled out, according to Obama's plan, over the next two years. Yeah, I want to throw uh, something else into this conversation, and I, I don't know if you have any insight into this, but there was also a German brigadier general who was one of the injured. Now, it, according to the story, the report says that his life doesn't seem to be in, in danger, uh, not a life-threatening wound, but it is an attack on both the U.S. and a, a German general. And I'm curious if, if, there's, if you've heard anything from the Germans as to what kind of a response there would be to this attack. And th furthermore, should there be a response from the U.S. military against the Taliban or, or the factions that may support this type of a thing? Now, I understand they don't have all the facts, or maybe they haven't released all the facts, but I can't imagine this not being... Of uh, you know just putting two and two together, some sort of an operation. It may have just been an embedded soldier waiting for the right opportunity. Uh, it, you know, in my mind, just throwing that at, into the conversation. Well, it depends on it depends on the rules of engagement. It all goes back to both the rules of engagement and the available forces. The Pentagon said earlier today that they believe that the person who did the shooting was an Afghan an Afghan soldier. Who and the shooter was killed in the incident. Mm -hmm. um, if this traces back to a planned Taliban operation, and they can find who did it, where they're located, which forces would conduct the operation against them? Given the uh, the way things are going in Afghanistan right now, it's increasingly likely that the forces that would actually conduct that operation would be Afghan forces because uh, our rules of engagement have gotten a lot tighter. Especially, it, for it, example, if they have to go at night, the Afghans, we don't, the U.S. isn't allowed to do night raids anymore. So the Afghans would have to do it. Uh, that, that's interesting that they can't do night raids. But, <laughs> well, you know, it lends to the bigger question, and, and I guess this is just like um, any other engagement. At what point do you look at this and say, why are we here and, and do we serve a better purpose being here or, or just leaving? And if our troops are going to sit here in harm's way without anything more to gain, um, you know, then maybe we shouldn't be there. But then again, you know, as, we, as you and John both pointed out, you never know what's going to happen as we saw what happened in Iraq. So it leads me to, I guess, the last two questions I'd have for you. Is there any progress on a status of forces agreement? And then I'm reminded by watching what's happening in Iraq, are there weapons that we have there that perhaps we shouldn't be leaving behind for the Afghan forces in case something did go wrong? Well, the status of forces agreement is pretty much on hold until the next ga Afghan government is put in place. And that depends on the election results being certified and, and the disputes being worked out between the two runoff candidates. So when somebody has declared a new president and that president creates a new government, that leader is expected to sign the status of forces agreement and then we can move forward with it. Uh, as to your second question, I think in any situation like this, it's best to simply assume that any weapon you leave behind will eventually fall into the hands of enemy forces. That was the concern. We've done this before in Afghanistan. We gave Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to the Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets. And uh, when the, the Mujahideen turned out to be the uh, the the core of what, the nucleus of what became Al-Qaeda, the CIA had to run in there and, and try to buy back as many of them as they could get their hands on. I, I was looking for a little bit of optimism here, and I'm not finding it, Charles. <laughs> well, 
Well, it, there there's a possibility for optimism. I mean, if if Afghanistan if the elections result in a strong central government that wins the popularity of the people, um, if Afghans perceive the Taliban more as a tool of Pakistani foreign policy, which in part they are, over an indigenous resistance movement, then it's likely that they'll be able to resist any attempt to retake the country once the U.S. forces leave. But there, there's a lot of ifs there, and, and it's hard to say whether the, any of them are going to come true. Mm. No, it, 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 this is going to be uh, you know, another one of those things we're going to watch unfold over time, and hopefully it plays out the right way, just for the sake of the what all of the men and women in our uniform have sacrificed not for the Afghani people and for the Afghani people themselves. I mean, I think at some point when you watch a country that's gone through so many decades of turmoil that you'd wish that, that their lot would improve, and hopefully it does. Certainly, and, and I've been there and I've met the people, and I, I hope their lot improves too. I think the, what I'd say in closing really is that the when the United States decided it was going to leave, it gave up control and influence over the situation. And when you give up control and influence over the situation, you're pretty much stuck watching and hoping. It, absolutely. Charles, if you can, and uh, folks, this is Charles Hoskinson. He's the opinion editor with the Washington Examiner. Uh, if you could please just give the website for the folks there so they can check uh, the things that you're working on and the other folks as well. Sure. Our, our website is www.washingtonexaminer.com. Great. Charles, it was a pleasure, as always, to have you. Thank you so much for your thoughtful analysis and uh, your contributions to the program today. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.